Hey there, you hopheads and malt brains. You're listening to Drinking Socially, Untapped's official podcast, and your inside look into what's happening in the Untapped community and the world of beer. This episode is brought to you by Firestone Walker. More from them in a bit. Lots of beer. It's going to be great. As always, like, subscribe, follow us online, wherever you follow things. You don't miss out on the next exciting interview we have coming up. New badges, all kinds of cool beer news. It's going to be a fun, fun season for sure as we enter the second half of it right now. And an exciting merch update for fans of clothes, which hopefully everybody is. Specifically, ones like this, the coupon code PODCAST that has up until now only worked on Untaps online store. So that's store.untap.com. It now works on Beer Advocate store and Hop Culture's online store. Yes! So now you can buy tons of cool stuff, impress your friends, maybe get them as gifts. I don't know. But go to store.untap.com, store.hopculture.com, or gear.beeradvocate.com. Save yourself some money. The coupon code is PODCAST, one word, all caps. Get some cool stuff for less. All right, so we're back. I know we've been away for a bit, but hopefully you've been following Kyle and I on Untaps. You're able to keep up with all the cool bloggers and IPAs and sours we've been drinking in the meantime. Today, we are going to add some more amazing beers to our recent activity, one of which I don't think I'd be able to get if it wasn't for today's guest of honor, Sam Tierney from Firestone Walker, specifically hailing from their propagator location in Venice Beach. So thanks to Sam's amazing work brewing up some of Firestone Walker's most unique beers, the Playground by the Sea has now become a must-visit destination, not just for surf fans and sunbathers, but now for any beer explorer worth their weight in, well, beer. Um, Which I guess is the same, it's just their their weight. But anyway, I digress. So what I'm saying is, you know, we would all love it there. We'll bring Sam on in a few minutes to talk about what's going on at the Propagator, which is Firestone Walker's, like, R&D brew house as well as this delicious sounding collaboration with Green Bench out of St. Petersburg, Florida, called Dabbling in Decoction. Ooh, look at that. Yes, what's that all about? What's Decoction? Some of you know. Everyone else will soon. It's an American Pilsner. It's going to be killer. And if we play our cards right, that won't be the only beer we drink today. I also will not so subtly try to get Sam to agree to distribute Wookie Jack nationally year round so we can all have it, which I know everybody wants just as much as I do. But first, I need to get my venerable co-host, Untaps Executive Vice President of Product, the OG voice of Drinking Socially, Kyle Roderick on the show to share some exciting news about Untap updates, talk about the badge we're going to highlight today. And I hear there's some exciting news regarding new styles in Untapped. Kyle, welcome yes. to the show. Hey, Harrison. How's it going? It is going super well. I'm already ready for a drink. I can feel the my throat drying, which is all yeah. according to plan. Time and right on time right. here then. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I can see that you're wearing, if you're on YouTube, new styles. Got yeah. that whole that whole new look. Very good. I'm in the vintage, the the that. old, the old stuff here. So um, yeah, go over there, use the the new coupon code. I can't get out of my head though, gear advocate, right? Yeah, gearhead. Hmm, maybe there's something there. There is something there. Can't can't quite put my finger on it, but uh yeah, gear dot gear dot beer advocate. Gear dot beer advocate, not gear yeah. advocate. Gear that's nope. somewhere else. I don't think a coupon code would work there. I nope. Know. Well, that's not. Don't don't even try. But right. uh you're right. right. I do have some updates to the untapped <laughs> app and untapped platform. So just as a little bit of background. Yeah. Every quarter or so up until 2020, we used to do quarterly style updates. And during that process, we would ask our team of moderators, global moderators made up of, you know, uh, beer advocates themselves, uh, (laughs) as well as brewers, business owners, folks that just love the untapped app uh, Mm -hmm. to all you know, put their best foot forward, ask for new styles to be added, represent new styles that maybe, you know, were just uh, coming out, uh, hazy right. IPAs, New England IPAs, things like right. that, that folks were just kind of starting to brew around the, the 2016, 2017 globally, right? right. Obviously right. going from regional styles to global styles. And that's what we want to try and represent as best as we can here. So, Uh, We've been doing that less frequently, but we uh, went through and did our first half of 2022 
style changes, style votes, and style updates uh, for Untapped. And the results, uh, drum roll, I don't have a drum, but point is we went through this whole process and we've got a bunch of new styles. So the newest styles that have been added to Untapped are Bitter Best. So we've done a little bit of reorganizing of the bitters. Yeah. Cold IPAs are IPA dash cold. Uh, finally made its way onto Untapped. It's really not just IPLs, folks. Yeah. It's right. it's cold. It's cold I'm IPAs. Joke. I'm gonna make that joke. <laughs> uh, we've we've got Lager Light Beer and Lager Mexican. Mm. Finally getting getting the Mexican Lager in there. Uh, we've reorganized a couple of others: Lambic Others, uh, Session and Short Meads. Uh, the eventuality of the XPA, so pale ale, XPA, or extra pale, sure. it's finally a, an, an official style here, at least with us, right? We're kind of weighing uh, BJCP and, and you know, uh, other um, other styles uh, as they've been represented in, in other more official capacities. Untapped, right. definitely not the official capacity of beer judging or anything. It's all just kind of an amalgam of everything together, sorghum, right. a millet beer. Yep. And then finally the Ukrainian golden ale uh, so cool. made its way to the untapped styles as a new addition. Um, we also it. renamed a couple of styles. You can go read all about this over at updates.untapped.com. Uh, but two more really important updates, I think that are worth mentioning. We introduced a new parent style called historical beer and aggregated a bunch of existing styles and a couple of new ones into historical beer. So you've got the Adam beer, yep. you've got the uh, struggling with these, the moon. Yeah, the, the Zoigel. Right. The Zoigel, right. Stein beer. We've got the Kentucky Common. Burnale. These, are the, these are words that like I've read on the page for years, but literally never tried to say them out loud uh, yeah. in words. So here, here I am back on the podcast making a fool of myself. <laughs> we also added new non-alcoholic parent style uh, to this, yeah, this style vote, which then breaks down into non-alcoholic beer IPA, non-alcoholic lager, pale ale, porter, shandy, Shams beer, Radler, Sour, Wheat Beer, mm -hmm. Mead, and Perry. So the addition of also not just non-alcoholic beers, but non-alcoholic meads and non-alcoholic ciders or Perry's. So lots and lots and lots of changes, which means that the badge that we're talking about this episode is Wheel of Styles badge, which now that we have all of these new additions brings that total style up to 244, meaning the max level that you can earn is level 48. Wow. Let's go. That's exciting Dude, stuff. It is. I mean, it is very exciting. I haven't looked Harrison at what level I'm at. I'm kind of wow. waiting. I'm going to try a couple of these beers. I'm going to see where I am towards the end of the episode. Maybe we can reveal, we can do maybe an over under uh, here on is, is Har does Harrison has Harrison tried more styles than I have? Probably not, but mm. Well, mm. I don't know. Maybe that's, we'll see. maybe that's a better a better bet than I realize, a better contest than I realize. <laughs> I'm trying to take a sneak peek now. The guy that only drinks like right IPAs and, and American lagers, how many that's right. levels of it's, it's just Kolsch. Right? You just yeah. keep saying Kolsch, Kolsch, yeah. Kolsch, Kolsch. Right. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why it doesn't level it up. Huh. Um well I'm gonna take a sneak peek at mine. Eh, okay, I'm doing okay. I thought I'd okay, I'm fine. Anyway, yeah, let's reveal that later. That's a good idea. Okay. All right. Um, including these styles, which one of them, I, it may be unlocking wheel styles, another level for me. We'll see. We'll see. Um, and actually let's, let's stop waiting. So we have our, our guest of honor kind of hanging out in the wings. He's probably already started drinking, which means we need to catch up. <laughs> let's get Sam on the show. Sam from sunny California. Welcome. How's it going, dude? Great. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sending all this amazing beer. Um, as a tradition, let's crack, this open and let's uh, enjoy some amazing beverages which i think you have gotten ahead of us there but um whew. let's yeah just let's as soon as i open that can the the entire room filled with oh man the magic of pilsner the magic of wonderful crackery, smell. pilsner hopness just jumping around let's start your i know i should pour mine um so sam i know we've got a fair amount of things to talk about we can probably start with the beer Let's, if I, I would, yeah, there we go. So if I was drinking this for the first time, which I am, 
and maybe I'm like a novice beer fan, what would you tell me to like look out for? What am I kind of experiencing or expecting in a beer that's that this beer? Well, I think first off, yeah, it's it's Man. a pretty light, crisp, refreshing Pilsner, but it's also a little more hop accented than a lot of uh, American Pilsners or, you know, I mean, certainly, you know, I think the, the use of the term American Pilsner was more of a, um, a nod to green benches use mm. of that for their postcard pills. Right. And I really like that naming convention. So um, when we started talking about what we wanted to do, I was like, well, I want to call it an American Pilsner. Cause I love that you guys call postcard an American Pilsner and right. the kind of story behind that beer and everything. So, um, mm. so yeah, so that's what we ended up going for and then kind of playing on that and then adding some more elements. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a little more hot focused maybe, but, um, but it's got, you know, a little bit of corn in it and, oh. um, you know, California grown Pilsner malt from Admiral. So it's, you know, really crisp, refreshing, but has a nice Brady character also from the mashing techniques, the decoction and all that. So, yes, which I want to unpack that in a second, but I'm diving in. I'm having first sips. I want to get Kyle's take too. Right. I love, so Pilsers, I love every time I drink one, I'm hoping for like that kind of crackery note that's in there, mm -hmm. like a club cracker. It's happening. It's amazing, but you're right. There's like, so what kind of hops are in here? Give me some kind of like insight there. It doesn't taste like, like German noble hops and as an American Pilsner it probably isn't, but what do we give me some knowledge here? What am I tasting or smelling on the hop front? Well, we started with Mount hood, which okay. is the hop cool. that green bench uses in their right. postcard. Postcard. And, you know, and so when we were talking about it, um, Chris was just like, yeah, let's totally use Mount hood. I love that hop. And we hadn't used it in a very long time. Um, we actually haven't used it the entire time I've been at Firestone, huh. uh, unless I'm misremembering something from like 10 years ago at this point right, when right, I was right. younger. Um, so it's, it's not a hop we currently use or have used in quite a while. Um, That's pretty cool. And so I was excited to, to use it again. So we got some of that in and then there's another new hop out of Oregon Oh. So Mountain Hood's kind of an older American yeah. noble, like I think maybe early nineties, not like a super old hop, but came about from the USDA breeding program that launched a few noble replacement hops in the nineties, trying to have, you know, American grown replacements for German hops. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so it's got a little bit of a German vibe to it, but I think it's a little right. like woody, piney, minty, mm. you know, in a way minty. that you don't yeah. really get out of a German noble hop necessarily. Um, and then, so then we paired that with one more hop that I was really excited about, which is called Lorien. And Lorien's from the Indie Hops Breeding Program, and they just released it maybe in the last year or two. It's pretty new. And I just heard about it from another brewer down here recently that was kind of raving about it. And I was like, okay, we got to give this a try. So we decided to pair those two hops together. And I think Lorien's more floral, um, right. more of like a bright kind of for almost like some orange zest or something like that, but not mm. over the top, like an IPA hop, but still kind of subtle and balanced, you know, um, still seems somewhat in the vein of a, of a German hop or a Czech hop or something like that. Um, right. even though it's a little more floral and fruity, mm. so they're calling it like an American noble replacement. So it's along those lines of a hop that's geared toward a lager or a Pilsner, but a little bit Americanized. I love that. And they, and Indie Hop describes it on their website as tangy fresh fruit and the feeling of a summer meadow near a cold mountain stream. <sighs> yes. Take me there. I'm there right now. It's happening. Um, I love it. I mean, the hop, we could probably do like a whole series of episodes on hop breeding. Who's doing exciting stuff now. We had CLS farms on last season. They were blowing my mind with knowledge. Um, we had uh, many people talk about it in the past, obviously individual brewers as well, like yourself, kind of just dropping hop knowledge. But it feels like, and this is maybe an obvious statement, but like such an exciting time for hops, period, not just in IPAs. Like there's been so much innovation over the past, what, 20 years on different strains and breeding and, you know, new hops that like we're enjoying right now. You don't have to have a triple IPA to be like, yeah, these hops are wild to really get something out of them. So this is, this is really, this is awesome. This is delicious. Hmm. Yeah, they yeah, definitely, I, they definitely come through in, in this, I think more as you were describing kind of the mint forward yeah. and, and a little bit of like orange, you do get that. It's not, you know, I think with maybe a bit sweeter malt, you would almost go overboard with it kind of leaning into that kind of, um, you know, honey, like, 
uh, territory that a lot of, um, you know, Pilsners kind of end up getting there. A little more corn, right? Almost too corny, a little too sweet. Mm. Um, balanced with the the orange would probably go, you know, a little off for me, but it, it pulls it back quite a bit with uh, with that minty character, in, in my opinion. Yep. I'm liking that a lot. I love it. And it was 100 degrees today in North Carolina where I am and probably 100% humidity. So this is like literally, I couldn't you buy that stream, Harrison? Is that? Yeah. Uh, I need to be mentally by the stream because yeah. I'm, I'm soaking wet from just standing, <laughs> wetting. Um, but this beer is, is helping that not really become a problem anymore. Um, something else, Sam. So this guy's dry hopped. Am I correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, cool. Is that, tell me a little bit about that because I know everyone has again their books about this, but like, our own approach to it for this beer specifically double dry up and dry up it at once what are we using if if that's not revealing too much behind the curtain but i'd love to know a little bit about kind of what's happening in the nose here and how it's and how i'm, I'm kind of getting how many players that i'm getting here Woo. yeah sure so in the kettle it's hopped you know pretty similar to a more traditional pilsner where you know we're only using those hops so they're kind of like moderate low alpha acid hops they're not going to mm-hmm. create a ton of bitterness so we're throwing healthy amounts of those in the boil kettle and also in the whirlpool and just kind of building, you know, the hot flavor okay. all the way through with that. And then we come back post fermentation. And this is something we've been doing with our Pivo Pilsner Ooh. for, you know, essentially a decade now is just this, you know, small amount of dry hopping just to layer on a little bit more character, Sure. you know, uh, not to go overboard. And I think that, um, you know, there's, there's definitely a place for the kind of like, I don't know what, you know, we're calling out here the West Coast Pilsners, the kind of new generation of American sure. IPA hopped Pilsners. You know, you want all that, all your IPA character in a super easy drinking beer at a lower alcohol. And, you know, that can be a nice mashup. But right. for us, there's that middle ground of, you know, and it's kind of like the approach that's come to be known as Italian Pilsner also. Yes. And right. certainly when we started brewing Pivo, um, there was just one beer essentially that we were really liking at the time that we wanted to make something similar to which is beer feature italiano's tifa pills nice. you know and and right. so um you know matt just borrowed that technique essentially from them um deciding to do a small dry hop on pivo and so uh we did the same technique here just kind of you know same approach where it's just a small amount of hops much smaller than you would do for an ipa and um it just layers on a little bit more of those hop you know, notes uh, a little more complexity because you're always going to get a little bit different character out of the hot post fermentation than you do in the whirlpool. You know, you're going to preserve right. more of the fresh aromatics, a little more of the greenness out of it. Um, so yeah, just, you know, as soon as fermentation's over, we just add in a little dry hop there and then, you know, wait for it to uh, finish maturation and then uh, chill it down. So nothing uh, terribly complicated. Nothing it's, it's kind of about restraint, you know, instead of excess. Right. I know. And that's kind of, it's like jazz. It's the notes you don't play. Like it's hard sometimes <laughs> to not double, double dry hop something these days. It feels like, should I do another addition? No, please don't. Um, not on every beer. So I love it. I think that's, I think that's amazing. Um, and that's a, that's pretty cool insight. I remember back in the day, we brewed a Pilsner all the time too. It wasn't one of my favorite brew days. Cause it was like, you know, it was like such a light malt bill. It was a couple of dry hops or a couple hop additions. And that was it. Like it's an awesome beer to, brew or solid beer to brew because it's just not like an imperial stout where you're up there sweating for an hour and a half mashing in with a wooden paddle which is what i had to do for imperial stout so um anyway this is hearkening me back to like those days of being thankful for right a beer that isn't high in abv and full of tons of hops because that's just a mess for somebody and that somebody was usually me um but this is this is freaking awesome and it's so talking about pivo obviously like looking at it, it's lighter less abv too obviously those are things that aren't related uh, but not um, not always so linearly, but like if you were to kind of, and you just did this a little bit, but I'm curious to dive a bit deeper on this idea. If you were kind of cu- put these two beers next to each other, Dabbled and Decoction and Pivo Pills, like what, where are they different? Where are they the same? Tell me more about just kind of like the thinking behind the Pilsners for you guys. So starting with the malt, we sourced Pilsner malt from Admiral. They were right. in the Bay Area up in uh, Northern California. So you know, they floor malt California grown barley in a kind of a traditional way that you would see done either in the Czech Republic or in England these wow. days are really yeah. the only places that still do that. Um, so their floor malted Pilsner malt actually shares some similarities with some of the traditional Czech malts that are That's still amazing. floor malted. Um, you, can, wow. you know, there's a 
a handful of different malts you can get from the Czech Republic that are floor malted, but they're, you know, except for maybe Wireman is the easiest to get. There's a couple right. others. Uh, Green Mench actually gets a floor malted Czech Pilsner malt from another supplier that we weren't familiar with. And I was kind of interested in that malt, but um, we decided to go all American on this one. Yeah. And, um, and so, yeah, Admiral was a good, good source for that. And it's a super pale malt. So it makes a nice light colored beer. And then something that Green Mench does in postcard, which um, I found really intriguing, was use a small amount of corn. So it's hmm. not like a high adjunct corn lager. Sure. It's more of that kind of pre-prohibition style, a little bit lower yes. corn. Um, and for this, I think it's about 10%. And okay. I think that's enough. It actually makes it a little bit paler, lightens it up just a touch uh, malt-wise. Um, so I think, you know, side by side with Pivo, it's actually even lighter in color. Yeah. And, um, you know, a little bit, like you said, lower ABV. Yeah, and um, you know bitterness is slightly lower, hmm. but almost in the range. Um, but right. then the, you know otherwise the hop charges are all pretty similar. So I definitely think though that um, the difference is uh, we use German Pilsner malt and Pivo, right. and a hundred percent German Pilsner malt beer does have a richer, fuller, breadier um, malt flavor. I right. think that the Admiral hmm. is a little bit leaner, even though it's floor malted. I think in the end it still has a slightly crisper grassier flavor yeah. versus the kind of more bready rich flavor right. yep. um and then yeah that corn just kind of lightens it up and crisps it out even more so wow. i'd say it's super crispy i mean for me it was like you know, we this was going to come out you know the very beginning of july and we knew that we just wanted a super refreshing beer that had a nice hop accent to it so i think it yeah. came together just how we were hoping well thank goodness and obviously you guys are right it's, it's warm there green bench knows a thing or two about humidity so oh, yeah. No better team up to put like a great, uh, you know, American Pilsner summer beer essentially than, than you two. So, and now Kyle and I, and we all get to benefit today. It's amazing. Yep. Um, you're right though. It's going to be tough to drink one of these, but I'll try to be professional. Um, but yeah, this is, whoo, this is awesome. Yeah, it's coming in at a, uh, in a 16 ounce format as well. Is that a decision made by you guys over at, at Propagator to put it in that format or was there a reason it's in 16 instead of your 12s or your, your, you know, Pivo's pretty typical, you know, glass bottles. So that's just the format that we put everything here in at the propagator. Right. Yeah. And that was the decision we made when we started packaging beer here in 2020. Um, you know, we wanted to really come across and differentiate ourselves uh, from the normal Firestone line and say, you know, we're doing something a little bit different. This is super small batch. This isn't coming out of the big brewery. So you know, the 16 ounce can has become, you know, the 16 ounce can with a sticker label like that is the calling card of the small brewery these days, you know, and that's what differentiates you in the marketplace. Um, and, you know, because we're such a small production here, we sell the beer at a higher price point. And so it's, it's part of kind of making the overall package, you know, something that you would expect coming from a small brewery. So, you know, if you're going to go to most small breweries around Southern California, um, they're going to give you a 16 ounce four pack and that's kind of standard now. Um, you know, until you get a little bit bigger and then you start diversifying into 12 ounce six packs or bottles, mm -hmm. you know, if you still do bottles, even though that's getting rare and rare, I guess these I days. Know. I know. Yeah, truly, truly is. I mean, just the can, like you said, the can art itself, that 16 ounce format is an art form these days. Like this has got that look for sure. Um, it is just key lines everywhere. It's got definitely a American Pilsner vibe. It is very good looking the uh artwork sent along as well to us yeah. also looking very very good um yeah so that's one good looking can for sure it is yeah we have a little fun with it always with the design you know um so we'll kind of meet and throw ideas out whenever we first start rolling on a, a new collaboration like that mm -hmm. and it's always good to look at the the partner that we're working with and kind of take some design cues from them so right. if you're familiar with green benches can designs you'll see a, a few familiar aspects as far as like some of the kind of diagonal lines kind of trapezoidal kind of shapes coming across right. um yeah or is that a parallelogram? I don't know. Right. You know what you know what I'm saying. So many we, don't, we, we, don't, we don't do math on the podcast. It's yeah. uh, it's one of, one of those rules. Yeah. Um, right. Let's not. Right. That's you know that sounds like work. This is not. That's not <laughs> not what this is about. Um, but yeah, I love that. Right. It's the collaboration doesn't end with the beer. It continues with the artwork. It's like the whole package. I mean, it's it's always so everything that. But both you got Green Bench and then Powers Walker does feel like it's so like well thought through um and, and really like to your point it kind of, 
it kind of has to be like if you want to stand out on a shelf or get some of the tension in in a can in a bottle whatever it is like good luck it's a lot of work and it's a lot of either finding an image or a color scheme or artwork or whatever it is um to draw somebody in and pick that beer in a sea of other kind of wild and intriguing cans bottles what have you so um but this is it's like classic looking it's it stands out um i i think it's awesome so that's a whole right we've talked about artwork a lot in this podcast too we don't need to do a dive too deep down that rabbit hole today although maybe we will but i love this and it's I definitely get like the right like sun city uh, sunshine city ipa and green bench ipa from green bench like they have that right whatever we're going to call it parallelogram thing happening like most of their beers do um that's kind of reflected on this one as well so love it love it yeah now, so let's talk about the propagator because we keep saying it like everyone on the podcast should know what it is. Maybe they don't. So really my understanding, it's like, and I'm just going to say a minute about this and then you should just really kind of lay some knowledge on it, Sam. But like you're doing a lot of like R&D brewing, like just kind of trying new stuff out. And some of the times the beers that you make at the propagator go like national, they become something like Wookie Jack that... Back in the day, I used to drink a lot of in Philadelphia when I was a younger man and just lived in bathtubs of black IPAs and unfortunately can't anymore. But um, but that's another story for no one needs to hear about. Um, point being, this is like a real, this is very unique. Like you said, it, it really is, even though Firestone Walker is an international name and beer, like the propagator is like, it's your own thing. You're doing your own show there. It's like a it's like a tiny brewery just like knocking out crazy beers all the time. Right. Basically it's like, let's see what works. Let's have some fun. Let's do some collabs and get in front of people. Yeah. It's a nice, um, it's, it's interesting. So, you know, we're about a three and a half hour drive from Paso Robles where the main brewery right, is. Right. And we're right in the heart of LA and Venice beach. And it's definitely a different vibe down here. Right. And it's like, you know, so what, you know, most large breweries do have pilot brew houses and, right. you know, a lot of smaller breweries do these days as well. You know, whether it's, you know, even if you're a 10 or 15 barrel small kind of, you know, local brewery, you might still have like a 10 yep. gallon homebrew system that you trial on, you know. Yep. But I think for us, um, being a larger brewery, so our small brewery is like a decent sized brewery, actually. So, right. you know, it's a 10 barrel brew house. We have 20 barrel tanks. So we put out decent sized batches enough. You know, these can releases are. 200 cases, which is actually decent size for all huh. the small breweries in this area. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that gives us the flexibility to basically market test stuff, you know, on a somewhat, you know, small scale. But, you know, we're doing direct to consumer shipping with all these in California, plus right. a handful of other states now that have allowed that it used to just be California. Um, we sell it at all three of our locations. So here in LA, up in Paso at the main brewery, and then at our Bear Works uh, pub and tap room in Buellton in Santa Barbara County, which is like smack dab in the middle, kind of as you're uh, driving up the coast. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're getting the beer out there. Um, you know, the beer's on tap at all three of our pubs. We do some limited distro in our core market on the central coast. So like, you know, just our top friends, you know, that have pubs and restaurants that are big Firestone fans, that you know want to get a couple special kegs you know we'll send them like one keg of a batch that we do here just so they can have a really exclusive beer um but other than that you know that's it that's as far as we get and um yeah it's just you know cranking out usually every week is a new recipe and we're always developing new beers and it's kind of a mix of working out ideas using new ingredients just to try them just to have fun and then right. you know more seriously working on projects that we know are going to become a new national release or something like that, or, you know, the next seasonal beer that needs to get worked out. And yeah. so, you know, it's always a mix of, you know, that like that R and D that's like, okay, we need to make sure this beer is perfect before we scale it up. Right. And then, Hey, let's try this new hop. Let's try this new malt. Let's try dry hopping in a new way that we haven't done before and see how it goes, you know? Um, and then, you know, let's collaborate and let's have fun with other breweries. And it's a great, you know, opportunity for us because, on the larger scale, you know, it got really hard as we grew to do a lot of collaborations because, right. you know, how do we just fit in a one-off of, you know, a 200 barrel batch of beer at like a minimum? Um, it gets difficult. So, you know, we did a lot of barrel age collaborations and that was always where we would play a lot in like different spaces. And, you know, every year for the Invitational, we would have a new barrel age beer collaboration come out. And so, you know, it's not like we never did collaborations, but once we opened the Propagator in 2016, 
we really started leaning into that. And at first it was all draft only, but then in 2020, we started canning when the pubs had to shut down and we needed to keep brewing. So pivoting mm-hmm. this year into doing all collaboration cans was a lot of fun. And we started yeah. doing that last year actually, but then this year, basically almost once a month now we're doing a new collaboration can release and it's been awesome. Amazing. Yeah. I was going to ask, I mean, it seems like a theme. It's, it's not just green bench. It looks like you guys work with green cheek as well, like a bunch of other amazing breweries. So it keeps getting more and more exciting. As I they do it. have to have green in the name yeah. though. Unfortunately, yeah, that's what we've learned here on this podcast. Thought, yeah. You, guys have did to. Steve, you did Steve with Russian river not too long there ago, right? It looks like the Keller pills coming back. I feel like, is that a beer you guys brewed in the past? Am I imagining that? Yes, we did. Yeah, we did a few batches of that. Um, this is the first time that it went into cans. I think okay. before hmm. it had been draft only. Um, we'd done a, a couple different ones up there. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it was really great to you know get a label on it this time, which awesome. Right. You know, same artist, Nachi, who did this label. Okay. Who we've been working with pretty heavily over the last couple of years, and she does amazing work. And I really, I really love that label, actually. It's yeah, great. it's it's sick. It's got the Russian River trees, but it's a little tripped out. I'm having fun enjoying looking at it right now. Um, but this is, this is so cool. So, all right, you mentioned collaborations, the invitational, let's talk about that. So it's been, I think like a, a two year hiatus since the invitational beer fest or so. Am I right on that, Sam? So you guys had it for obvious reasons. Or yeah. It? Yeah. It was so great to have it back after being off for two years. Um, you know, it was one of those ones. I remember that was when everything started shutting down March, 2020, actually, that was one of the things that when we decided to pull the plug on that was like, Oh, this is real, you know, like this is anyway. So um, after being off for a couple of years, you know, coming back was amazing. I think everyone was super stoked to get back out there. I mean, every brewery was having an amazing time, just so happy to be there. And uh, you know, um, the organizers, you know, led by Veronica Crowell, who's been doing it since the beginning, um, just, do an amazing job and Matt put so much work into that too, getting all the brewers together, hosting everybody. And, you know, it's just such a phenomenal festival and yeah, I, I just have so much fun every year. Um, you know, I can't wait just the amount of great conversations that I get to have with amazing brewers. You know, it's like, I, I just basically spend the whole time going around finding people I know that I I haven't talked to in a long time or (laughs) meeting brewers that I've always wanted to talk to that, you know, haven't come yet or something like that. And so, you know, I get exhausted just trying to have, you know, trying to check in with everybody basically, but you can't even get to, there's too many. So, um, it's always like, I wish that festival was like a week long, but, um, Mm -hmm. but also I don't. (laughs) (laughs) Right. I guess 22. Yeah. Um, that would be amazing, but also right. You need probably another week off after that just to recover. Um, but uh, you know, that was once a year, man. It's not the worst thing, but it, it's certainly great to be right. Like getting back together with people and people you haven't seen in a while, especially over a beer or a few and just talking about stuff that, uh, that you guys love. So that's, I'm excited that happened again this year for you guys. I saw some pictures looked amazing. The lineup was like unreal. So, um, yeah, it kind of feels the vibe I got from it. It felt like just like, an old school beer fest. There's some music, people are hanging out like, but it's about the beer and it's about the breweries. And I mean, that's, that's all I can ask for really. So pumped for you guys to have that back. And um, yeah, that's, I got to just get out there. There's a many, I'm like have a small list here. That's getting longer by the moment of like why I should be visiting California a couple times a year. So that's, that's easy. That's another one for the list. It's road, sorry, Harrison. I, did I hear you right? Road trip. <laughs> you say, yeah, Coastal maybe. road trip, Firestone. Right. Okay, Ooh, yeah, I think I heard right. that right. We can camp in the beer. We can garden. make that happen. <laughs> Just you, you to me, and we'll I'm, we'll meet in the middle somewhere. I think Firestone between you fly into LAX between wow. where I am and and that's basically Firestone. It's meeting in the middle somewhere. All right, so that's good for me. I'll, I'll rent a van and we can live in the van. <laughs> Don't Just in the beer. yeah, in the Firestone parking lot. That's a great idea. Lot. Yeah, that, I don't good. think that they'd like that very much, but no, no. I mean, we do have plenty of people camp. That's actually a big part of it. Is we do have a campground next to it. There we so go. You get to go. You, you got See? a van. You're all That's set. It. A van, Man. you're right. You're over prepared, probably. You could bring like a duffel bag or just nothing and sleep under a tree. <laughs> um, <clears throat> which maybe on on St- on par. Store.untap.com. That's right. That's all great. that's all we need in our lives. That's right. <laughs> get your hammock for your beer fest. <laughs> um we got it all. No, we don't, not yet, but maybe someday. Um so let's okay, cool. So 
I want to talk a little bit more about the propagator. So we talked about, obviously, your R&D and stuff. Sometimes it's just, let's see what happens with these hops and these malts and these our friends that are other brewers. Sometimes, though, it's like, all right, we have to, like, develop a new double IPA or we want something for a new mixed IPA pack, it sounds like, too. Like, there's seems like some intention sometimes around, like, we need a new X kind of beer. Sam, go make it happen. Is that is that kind of how it goes down? Or what's that whole process like about we need to fill something with the national lineup to the propagator we go? It usually starts, yeah, um, at least six months to a year out from when we need to get start getting stuff planned. So, yeah. you know, we'll have monthly meetings where we're checking in on everything that's coming down for the next year, how what the progress of all those projects are, and then, you know, start planning when we're going to get those beers brewed, what steps we need to take, how many batches we think it's going to take to, to try them out. So it's a pretty involved process. And, yeah, it's usually, you know, looking at least a year out on that stuff and then, you know, nailing down, you know, for us um, – you know, we like to present all that stuff the summer before. So everything is going to get presented actually coming up this month. Oh, wow. Um, that's going to go national next year. So everyone has to know already. So we basically have to know what all those things are already. Um, <laughs> Look, you Jack. <laughs> okay, cool. That's great. That's uh, I'm glad we're talking now, Sam. Um, <laughs> interesting. How serendipitous. Uh, but that's, that's okay, cool. So, so you kind of present what you want or what, filling the need of, you know, what you and Matt are talking about and everyone else at Firestone Walker in terms of natural releases is the next step. Like let's brew a couple pilot batches. Let's like take me down. Kind of, we present it green light. What happens next? Yeah. Then we're going to look at, you know, okay. So what style of beer is this? Um, you know, do we need to develop a wholly new technique is this something that we're not comfortable doing already um is this you know how close is this to our current comfort zone or current beers you know do we have uh, a hmm. recipe already in the bag from you know the last five years of the propagator of brewing right. where we can say okay like this is similar to this beer that we really liked and we kind of want to pull this back yeah. and tweak it so you know we developed a pretty deep catalog of things that we've tried at this point so a lot of times it's just kind of going back and saying okay you know was this close to what we wanted and you know sometimes you know things are a little ahead of their time i mean i've been brewing you know i've been trying to make like schwartz beer happen and the brewers here before me were trying to make schwartz beer happen since the beginning and i think every year it comes up are we going to try to add that to distro rotation you know i go i got a great recipe worked out it's all ready to go um but alas not yet not yet Mm, yeah yeah yeah. Got, that's not my vote. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, let me know if you think I'm, I'm wrong in this, Sam, but I feel like for the past five years, whenever someone does an article in the interview brewer, brewer is about what's the next beer going to be for five years have been like lagers, lagers, lagers. And I think it's because brewers are like, I want to brew more lagers. I want to drink them. And they man now here's a Pilsner. They're lagers everywhere. Kind of manifested the reality of now everybody loves lagers, which is great. Um, can that happen with a Schwartz beer, which is another blogger, but like, can we just manifest this into happening if we tell enough people, Hey, Schwartz beers are the next thing. And then they are, I think we probably could. I think maybe, you know, I think in some <laughs> ways um, brewers are like the fast lane of beer trends because uh-huh. they're, um, they're the most intense beer consumer, right? There you go. Right. Um, they're the closest to it. They're, drinking more than most um, (laughs) is probably the reality there uh, as far as, you know, craft beer goes. Sure. And so I think everyone that like gets into craft beer really seriously eventually develops a brewer palate. It just takes longer. Brewers just get there faster. Right. That's what I mean. So I think whatever brewers are really into, um, at least I like to think that eventually the market will shift there. And hopefully that doesn't mean that in the end, we all just make light lager again. Um, Right. It's, but, it's a cycle. It'll 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 bounce down, and then people will be like, "Remember hops? Remember bitter things?" And they'll be like, "Yeah, West Coast IPAs to make that again." Which I think is kind of happening a little bit right now, where we were on this hazy IPA train, and now I'm seeing West Coast style IPAs popping up all over, which is great. Yeah, um, people keep telling me that, but you know they never died here, so. Right, I know, I know. You're yeah. right. That's the only <laughs> for me to say. Um, but yeah, I still I remember the, the the good old days of drinking. I say this almost every podcast: drinking Green Flash's West Coast IPA is like a 21 year old and being like, "What's happening to my mouth?" <laughs> I miss that. Um, but anyway, it's coming back to North Carolina, I guess. But spoiler alert: never left California, which as a yeah. West Coast IPA should yeah kind of kind of alludes to it. 
Um, cool. All right. So Schwartz beers, it's happening soon and we can make it happen. I'm all about that. Shh, forget it. That's yeah. Yeah. A dark lager. Sign me up. Well, I think you, you, you said it as well, right? Like lower ABV, I think is the other trend. Like if we take style, you know, itself out of the picture, ABV is trending downward overall, more drinkability, more sessionability, whatever you want to call it. Right. Um, making them, you know, easier, easier to drink and easier to pack up in six packs, 12 packs, you know, whatever, whatever format makes sense for what it is you're trying to put out. I think that that also, um, is one that we've seen really, I, I guess maybe more dominated by potentially the seltzer trend of like everything's fives and everyone's looking for <laughs> that wanting to be just middle of the road five. So anything under fives, like I know I gravitate towards it when I'm at the grocery store, but yep. yeah, these, these days that seems to be one that I, I'm also noticing quite a bit. This, this one fits this, uh, this beer we're drinking right now fits right into that. Mold. Yes, it does. I can have a lot of them, but I'm trying to only have one. Cause we have more beer to drink today too, but no promises. Um, yeah, but I'm, Oh man, now I'm thinking about Schwartz beers and how to make that happen. And that's a unique style, like, it's like Sprecher, uh, out of, I think, what, what, Milwaukee? Am I wrong? Maybe, like they have, like, or so Wisconsin, Glendale. They have Black Bavarian, which has been, like, their flagship forever. And that's, like, you go there, and it's it's everywhere. But that is a style you don't see all over the place yet. Oh, that'd be cool as heck if two years from now we're, like, Black or Schwartz beer is the new IPA. <laughs> yeah, I think out here, you know, the only brewery off the top of my head – that I can think of. I know Ennegrin, um, which mm-hmm. is in Moore Park, just north of LA. Okay. They do a Schwartz beer. I don't know if it's year round or whether it's kind of an intermittent release, but I feel like you can find it a lot. And they're, you know, they're one of the only like German specialty brewers in Ooh. Southern California. Um, I guess you, yeah, there's Epic down in San Diego. Um, I'm probably missing a couple. I'm sorry, but Northern <laughs> California, you've got Moonlight. Mm-hmm. Right. does death and taxes black lager which they don't right. call a schwartz beer it's a san francisco style black lager uh-huh. but it's <laughs> drinks a lot like a schwartz beer and yeah. it's phenomenal and yeah. they um you know i think thankfully with patrick rue taking on half of the brewery um in that they're kind of recent uh, shift in ownership away from heineken or mm. lagunitas um right you know, they, they've got a lot of uh, good energy going there that's going to carry them to the future so i'm really stoked for them because that beer's actually fairly easy to get around the bay area now as they've expanded a bit and their cans have good distro in the bay area and so yep. every time i'm back up there i'm always looking for that it's happening so you're saying it's, it's kind of happening at least in the bay area um the schwartz beer is growing i know you're right i see it seasonally favorite of mine is dark helmet from westbrook brewing out of south carolina because again i'm in the carolinas i can get that easily but it's like a seasonal it's hilarious slow it's got the Helmet from Spaceballs. It's hilarious. Anyway, if you're over 25. I hope you know what I'm talking about out there in the world. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, cool. All right, I'm all about this. I'm going to keep tabs on Schwartz beers being the next big thing. I'll do my part. I'm sure Kyle will as well. Everyone out there, start drinking them. We can make it happen. At the end of the day. Well, I don't like, know. Maybe Czech Dark Lager is already going to oh, overtake oh, Schwartz right. beer. You're you know, right. that seems to be the new trend. I almost see more of those now than Schwartz beers. Now that everybody knows what that is, they, right. they all kind of discovered it at the same time. So that's like the new thing everybody's got to try. That's a great and, call. Um, and I've had a couple of really great ones. So Likewise. I'm I'm stoked on it. I think they're super tasty beers. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's happening. Dark lagers. All about it. Loving this stuff. Something that is not a dark lager, though, but we get to drink it right now, is out of your new IPA mixed pack. I'm going to grab mine. Do you have Mellon Conspiracy nearby, Sam? Can we dive into this guy now? So, <laughs> poor planning on my part, but we just sold out of it, and I didn't set one aside. <laughs> so I do not have one. All but right. you guys got it. <laughs> and I certainly it. know what it tastes like, so we shouldn't have any problems there. I was going to say, I, think, I feel like I can trust you to tell us a bit about it as we enjoy it. So this is... So give me, like, the... Let's talk about the origin story of this. Like, okay, Miller Conspiracy. Well, my first question is like, and I feel like I have to ask this these days, there's melon in this, yay? Like actual melon. It's not like melon flavors from stone fruity things or? No, there are no fruit flavors or fruits added to it. Uh, okay. It's melon, the German hop variety. Oh. Uh, cool melon. 
Oh, oh yes. Got it. Perfect. So it is a conspiracy. In fact, you're confirmatory here. It is a conspiracy. No melons in right. the melon conspiracy. Is that the exactly. gist of it? Is that, yeah. Oh, man. The pun was right there, and I, it just <laughs> ran right by me. That's unlike me. Usually I'm the first man to spot a pun from a mile away. Ooh. So this is maybe not the exact opposite, but certainly not an American Pilsner. So talk to me. Talk to us, Sam. What's happening here? In this hazy looking, oh, it does smell just like a bunch of friggin' cantaloupe. Woo! Yeah, so, you know, we've been using Cool Melon for almost a decade now. I was trying to think of when we got the first samples in. It must have been um, when I was around because, yeah, those hops didn't come out until about 10 years ago. Right. But um, the first beer we put that in was Easy Jack, our session IPA. Oh, yes. And, um, you know, so that was it for a while. And then when we started doing our Luponic Distortion rotating IPA series, Melon was one of those hops that found its way into a lot of different blends because it just has this really nice, ripe, melony, just like fruity character that balances out a lot of hops. And the cool thing about those German flavor hops is that they don't have the the kind of like grungy dankness of American right. hops. Okay. They, you know, the hop readers in Germany are really sensitive to that. And I think, so when they tried to make more American-like hops, so, you know, in that era, they put out Melon, um, Hellertal Blanc, right. Mandarina Bavaria. Mandarina Bavaria right. And then Mandarina after Bavaria. that, Kalista and Ariana were the, the ones that came after. And right. I think Ariana didn't land as well with American okay. brewers, but I think Kalista's found favor and yes. we certainly like Kalista too. I think it's got a nice peachy character to it and it's super low alpha. So it's actually really good for hazies and we use them. Uh, we use it in a lot of our hazies. Um, it's a really good whirlpool hop because it brings a lot of flavor and, um, and mouthfeel without adding a lot of bitterness. Um, yeah. Yeah. But melon specifically. Yeah. We've yeah. always loved because it just sometimes it even goes into like a watermelon Jolly Rancher character where it's just this really nice, bright fruit right. character. And, um, and yeah, we really dig it. And then we thought, you know, but on its own, it's a little soft. Um, it. So pairing it with mosaic in this beer was the perfect solution for that because mosaic can be a little over the top on its own. You know, right. You guys have had plenty of mosaic single hop IPAs, oh, I'm sure. So you know it. what that's all about. All the and they can be great. But they can be big and punchy and like, yeah, lots of berry and yep. just like stone fruit and just right. and dankness too. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think melon and, uh, and mosaic are this perfect combination where you get that nice ripe melony fruitiness and then you get the berry, you know, and you get some of that citrus tropical thing going on. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a fun combo. And then, you know, the base. And so that's, you know, base beer that we developed here back, you know, it's basically, um, when we were first coming out with our first AZ IPA mind haze, yeah. we did a ton of test batches here and we were, because, you know, we hadn't brewed that style before, you know, we were just classic West coast, you know, union Jack, the pond distortion, easy Jack were the three IPAs we were making at the time. And they all followed, you know, a pretty similar model. And right. then when we decided to, to brew hazy IPAs, we kind of did, you know, deep dive, did a lot of research. We wanted to make sure, you know, as a distributing regional brewery, we had to put something in a can that had a decent shelf life that was stable, that, you know, wasn't going to completely fall apart or get weird within a month. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, we did a lot of research on that, um, kind of came up with a, not a that different of an approach, but I think, you know, we just had to make sure that we were doing it in a way that we felt really comfortable with. Cause I think at the time uh, we were doing that, it was like, you know, that was still back in the day when people were trying all kinds of crazy stuff, you know. And I think, like, as the techniques for brewing New England IPAs, hazy IPAs spread around the country and became more normalized, like, everyone kind of figured it out. But, you know, there was like a year or two there where it was pretty sketchy when everyone yeah. was trying it for the first time. And you got a lot of weird beers. And, like, you, you know, yeah. it was like they were throwing, like, apple pectin and flour and, the and flour, like, all kinds right? of yeah. stuff. Yeah. I remember the um, flower. Golly. Yeah. Oh, so, man. yeah. So we were like, okay, how are we going to do this? You know, and we had brewed a German Hefeweizen for a long time hmm. and, That's you know, great. felt like we knew how to make a good hazy beer base. And we we're like, I don't think you need to stray that far. 
Right. Um, we just need to kind of tweak it a little bit, you know? Right. And so we kind of started from that space and kind of worked from there. And then, you know, talk to a lot of people that were making good examples of the style, you know, that were able to, you know, share their approaches to hopping. And so we ended up kind of tweaking things from there. So that's how we ended up coming out with mine haze, but in the process, we tried a lot of different stuff. And so these beers, these propagator series beers are a continuation of that where, you know, we're taking that base essentially tweaking it subtly, you know, we're always playing with it a little bit. So it might be slightly different on the malt side each time, but, um, you know, cause we're always trying new stuff, you know, we don't want to stay too stagnant. Sure. Yeah. Um, and then these hop combinations, you know, we brewed tons mm -hmm. of single hop IPAs here over the first few years and we really found the hops and then the combinations of hops that we loved. And so for us, melon and mosaic was killer. And, and that's, uh, that's how we ended up with the melon conspiracy. Hell yeah. With a great name too, which I get now and I'll be made fun of online for not understanding beforehand, but that's mm, fine. Definitely. Um, it's fine. It's totally cool. Totally cool. Um, <laughs> this is delicious. I mean, you gotta be kidding me. It's, it's like 6%, 35 IBUs. All right. It's like not crazy bitter. It's what you want in a hazy IPA, but I love the, like the, the Hugh melon and the mosaic combo. I mean, it's just two hops. I, this is, this is awesome. This is a different kind of summer beer. This is like fruit salad. It's not overwhelming. It's like super refreshing. And yeah, I'm I'm a thousand percent on board with this. So I'm guessing like wheat, Munich, some kinds of oats. Like tell me about the malt bill too for this guy. What's what's happening? Yeah, we use um, you know, just uh our standard base malt, which um we mostly get from RAR, uh okay. Canadian. And then um yeah, well, you know, add in a little bit of malted wheat, a little bit of unmalted wheat, Got and um, and the oats. We like the um, the uh, blonde roast oat from Brees is what cool. we're using, and it adds a nice kind of like nice toasty oat character too. Also, flaked oats we like too. So there's Love a good it. mix of stuff in there. Um, and then yeah, um, you know, hop wise, it's just you know whirlpool hopped and then dry hopped, and um, mm -hmm. and I think you know, like you're saying, yeah, it's like it's almost it's not too heavy. It's um, yeah it's a little bit lower ABV for the style. And I think yeah. like um, we found, you know, with a lot of hazies and like even the stuff I brew here at the propagator, a lot of the time I go a little bit on the heavier side because I do like that, like really intense expressive character you sure. get out of the yeast that we're using, okay. um, which gets, you know, more estuary and more intense, like stone fruit, like peachy and like pineapple mm. at a higher ABV. Um, but, you know, we can get that also at a lower ABV and make a more, you know, refreshing, crushable beer too. So, you know, I, I think that with these beers, um, you know, they're not overly sweet. We kind of try to find that balance yeah. and drinkability. And, um, and then, you know, we also do centrifuge the beers. And so nice. we, we found a way, you know, to stabilize the haze and like, so, you know, it's not clearing the beer up really, but, um, but it is like pulling out any hot burn or coarseness and like that kind of harsh bitterness you can yeah. get in some hazies, which, you know, if done well, a little bit more of that, like is part of the really like intense side of the style that a lot of sure. people like. And sure. I totally respect that. But for us, like it, when you want a more, you know, refreshing, balanced, almost like sessionable version of the style, I think that really helps get the balance there. Yep. I agree. Yeah. This is awesome. Right. Yep. Yep. Well said. I mean, this is, yeah, it's sold. I'm glad I have more of them. Whew. And it is, we talked with Matt a little bit about this, but it's like, it's, it has to be said that like, it's hard to brew like a, or at least a shelf stable, like hazy IPA. Cause like you said, I remember a couple of years there where it was like, you'd pick one up that had been on the shelf for a little bit and you open it up and it'd be clear. And then it'd be a bunch of gunk would fall out of the can as you pour it in your glass where this poured out beautifully hazy, it looks perfect. It's not like settling out or anything. So like, it's just like, and that's, I feel like a lot of people don't understand that's like hard to do. Um, so hats off to you. You figured it out. Um, yeah. Just all got to get all the pieces in the right place basically right. for that style, you know, and that was part of the fun of developing it and doing, right. you know, all the testing is that, you know, you didn't know. And so, right. you know, we were trying a bunch of yeast strains in the beginning, trying different mm -hmm. malt approaches, different hop combos and, you know, it's been fun to see what works and doesn't work. And, you know, sometimes, you know, luckily um, I can't think of like, you know, maybe only one batch that came out that we were just like, okay, this just didn't work at all. <laughs> but for the most part, you make some interesting beers along the way, but yeah. But when it comes to like that, that beer that you're going to put into a can yeah. and you know, you're going to put out and it's going to be in a grocery store, right. like you got to make sure you nailed it there. Cause yeah. um, you know, that's super important. That consistency. Nailed it. Nailed it. And beautiful artwork again. Um, I mean, this is like, this can's a trip. And so, uh, I, I'm going to miss say their name, but Nachi 
Elitit. Elitit? Yeah, Nachi. Yeah. Nachi? Okay. Impressive. This is sick. And so you said you've been working uh, with them for a while. Is that right? Yeah, she's been our main artist, I think, starting uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, <laughs> she came on and... Uh, yeah, I mean, she's just been great with all the different projects. We've had a couple other artists, too, that um, we've done labels with here and also with the cans um, for the Propagator series stuff. But I think once we um, once we kind of fell in love with the way her style blended with kind of the vibe we were going for, uh, and she's based out of the Central Coast, too, so okay. she's local. Um, and, yeah, it just it just kind of works. And now we, we have this kind of, uh, like, Propagator brand identity that we've developed with her that I think works really well. I agree. It's awesome. Naji killing it, killing it again, the whole thing. It's, it's, uh, it's quite the experience. And for someone who's right, it feels like, all right, this is what I imagine. Like the central California coast is like just a, a thing like this floating half awake eye and a bunch of palm trees. And it's kind of, <laughs> this is feels like some Lords of Dogtown stuff, um, in a, in a great way. Um, but I, uh, yeah, this is, uh, whoo. This is rad, Sam. I mean, thank you so much for taking some time today to hang out with us. I'm curious, though, before we let you go and find some more beer or do whatever you have to do, which is probably fix something. Um, <laughs> what's next for Firestar Walker, for the Propagator? Like, what should people be looking out for over the next, the rest of the year? Like, what can we get excited about that you're allowed to reveal yet beyond Wookie Jack and everybody's home? What else can we be looking forward to? Well, right now I've got a couple batches of a new double IPA in the tanks and that's being done for the California Craft Brewers Association collaborative brew, oh, cool. which is something that uh, you're going to see a ton of California breweries releasing here in the next month. And that's something that's, um, that's done to raise money for the, the California Craft Brewers Association. Great. And for us in California right now, they're doing a lot of great work lobbying for legislation that makes it easier for small brewers to operate in the state. And, um, you know, like just right now, the state legislature is um, is debating uh, changing regulations on direct to consumer shipping. And mm -hmm. that's something that we've been able to take advantage of with the propagator beer, certainly sure. over the last couple of years. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, everybody that has a beer club in California um, that, you know, ships to all the, the club members and everything like that. So, you right. know, I mean, I know brewers that their entire business model at this point has been based around being allowed to do that so um that's under threat right now and they're doing you know they're basically the vanguard for us of like you know trying to get that so it stays in our favor because i think it's worked out well i mean i know you know all the uber beer geeks in california i think especially starting in 2020 really appreciated being able to get cases from their favorite breweries delivered overnight to their door yep. and um you know it would be uh heartbreaking at this point to for that to be taken away i think it would be horrible for the industry so that's just an example of what's going on right now um but yeah they do great work and um and so yeah so that's a fundraiser that you're going to see tons and tons of breweries um supporting to wow. to raise money for that right now um so we're yeah. doing a version of that and it's going to be a new uh west coast style double ipa um using a couple new varieties of cryo that we haven't played with and um yeah just doing some fun stuff you know it's like I only brew a few double IPAs here a year <laughs> and every one, you know, we have fun with now. We don't do a year round West coast IPA, at least for now, maybe right. uh, you might see one come next year. Who knows? But, yeah. um, but since double Jack went away year round, oh, yeah. um, you know, it's only been seasonal that we brought stuff back. So, um, so yeah, we like to do a few of those here every year, uh, the propagator. Um, then after that, we have a few more collabs coming up and um you know i don't think i'm ready to announce all those right now but Got i will it. say the sure. next one we have nailed down is going to be with humble c out of santa cruz oh wow and i'm really stoked right. to work with those guys i'm from santa cruz hey. and um they make amazing beers they're doing such great work right now they were down at the invitational and they totally crushed it so um yeah i uh I can't wait to work with them. I'm going to go brew something with them too. I think we're going to do a Pilsner, but um, we're going to do a hazy IPA or sorry, a foggy IPA here. Ah, yes, of course. Yes. Their take on the That's style. Right. So super stoked on that. Um, and wow. then, yeah, you know, who knows? I mean, you'll see Wookie Jack again. No, no promises in <laughs> what format, but you know, whether it's brewed here or, or somewhere else, you know, it, it. it's, it's not going to die completely. Good. I, Good. I just got to be your mule Harrison. That's it. Like that's it. Direct to consumer shipping. Got to keep it around. Got to keep it around. You can also, um, we've got a blog about this as well. You can go check out 
Beer deliveries are now in danger. Act now uh, over on our blog. We'll include a link in the show notes to that. So you can go and sign that. Good. Yes. Yeah. I mean, good gracious. Let's not take that away. That was one of the right, the silver linings of the past two years is for a lot of consumers, a lot of breweries. Holy cow. That would be, yeah. So such a, just such, such a step back for the whole industry. So but we got to make it happen. So, right. We'll put a link in the show notes for, for that. We'll keep supporting everyone that's out there doing the good work and making it happen. And um, yeah, I mean, that's yeah, let's not lose that. But um, for today, I mean, Sam, I just want to thank you again from both of us. This has been a blast. I feel smarter. I feel happier. Let's use that as the word. Um, I'm excited that I have three more dab and decoctions <laughs> to, to jump through. Um, not tonight probably. Um, but this has been, this has been awesome, man. Keep doing the great stuff you're doing to the propagator. It's just, I mean, it's, it's knocking people's socks off. So, um, yeah, love it. Well, thank you guys. I really appreciate you having me on and, um, yeah, I'd, I'd uh, love to come back sometime. So we'll yeah, maybe we can, yeah, bring Wookie Jack on, do Pivo pills. We can, yeah, go down the rabbit hole, right? Something we can make it happen. Sure. Sure. Hopefully maybe. We'll see. We'll hope. I'll hope. I'll hold on to my dream of Wookie Jack being in everyone's home all the time on tap in your <laughs> kitchen. Um, until then, though, I guess, maybe I'll just live in my my dreams. But maybe one yeah. day, if we maybe can make... if we get a Wookie Jack badge, we'll manifest Wookie Jack. <laughs> that seems that's that seems legit. I yes, yep. Right. IP, IPA dash black. I think is uh, yeah. It needs one. It needs, needs a one. Song. It needs its own badge, right? If you build it, they will come. But if you make a badge for it, they will drink it. So it's I true. think we're on to something there. I like that. No promises. But I think we're on the... Certainly if everyone listening right now, probably jumping up and down and going, make that happen. So I'll look forward to my Instagram DMs and my untapped DMs just dying. But uh, until then, Sam, keep doing what you're doing. You're doing great work. You're making amazing beer. We're all better for it. Cheers, man. Thanks so much. Cheers. Thanks, guys. All right. Kyle, how we doing over there? Good. Extremely good. Very good. Uh, enjoying the remnants of this Pilsner. <laughs> digging yeah. a little deeper into the 12-pack, uh, including Melon Conspiracy and a couple of other great beers that are also a part of that 12-pack. Please, please do. If it is distroed in your area or you're able to get it direct, do go get it. Some yeah. really, really incredible stuff. So Harrison, look at this thing. It's got it all. It is good. Like that's yeah. a that's a heck of a that's a heck of a mix pack. I love it. I know Union it's very, Jack. Very good. Yeah, Union Jack's one of those. A lot of memory. A lot of memories of Union Jack. Obviously, we had Hopnosis on the show. Mind Haze is always great. Um, and now Melon Conspiracy. We gotta we get to add that to the list. We get to check these things in. We get to brag about Wheels of Style. We should do that check in. We should. We told everybody we'd look at Wheels of Style before we left. And yes. Compare. All right, how's this working? You're throwing a number out there, Kyle. Yeah. We, uh, okay. Well, so it, obviously, Untapped's not a competition. Never sure. is. Right. It's about <laughs> your your own personal exploration through the beard world <laughs> and you you enjoying uh, you know trying new styles and in That's in right. fact enjoying those styles, learning right. more about those styles. But right. in f for this episode, this is definitely a competition between Harrison and I. So. <laughs> <laughs> wheel <laughs> wheel of styles i will say i do have retroactive badges turned on so for that's whatever why. that's worth okay you do too that's okay level the playing field good good deal uh as of today right now with these two being added because i have had definitely hazy ipa and have had pilsner right wheel of styles level 37 that is 187 different beer styles as we call them here right obviously on on untapped probably the one of the more recent ones that stood out to me uh march april koji beer i had a koji beer oh, which was really? just strange next level uh over at high wire in Asheville, yeah. and uh one of the new kind of classifications of styles the dark mild Ooh, yeah any any kind of three percent english mild beer like yep. dark light 
whatever. Give that to me. That's that's what I'm into. So that's me right now, Harrison. Where where do you sit? Well, Kyle, I I called it. So I get some points for this. You are defeating me. You have won this round. I am one checking away from level 29. So I've had more than 40 different styles checked into untapped. But and maybe this gets me bonus points. The last beer that unlocked wheels of style for me was Mind Haze Optical hey. Crush, baby, from Firestone Walker. I enjoyed Very their, nice. uh, that variety pack the other weekend. I grabbed that 12 pack up with a bunch of cool, like tiki inspired variations on Mind Haze. Uh, and the Optical Crush was my favorite, I think. It's hard to pick one. But uh, fitting for today's show. So you win the battle, but the war continues. <laughs> I don't know if I win anything at this point, honestly. <laughs> but it's uh, it is definitely it's it's the long game, right? It's it's the journey. It's not about you know where you are now. It's it's about how uh, how you get there. It's how you get there. It's all about the journey. The whole thing is a journey. You don't want to get to the end. The end. No. Uh, the end's the end. Forget it is. About it. Yeah, I've I've I have plenty of friends who are at the the tippy top. So. I know. Again, level 48, based on all the styles we've got. Typically, most badges level up to 100. Right now, capped off level 48. I don't know how we're going to come up with 250 more styles of beer. This is a challenge to brewers. 250 (laughs) more styles of beer is what we need to get this to level 100. So, I I don't know. Right. Here's here's my take. As soon as we land on Mars and the first brewery on Mars opens, then it's like Mars IPA, Mars Lager. It's right. We double all the styles. Just double. Dub, okay. So new pl- new planet. That's uh, got it right. done. Quantify easy p- easy peasy by planet. So we might see that in our <laughs> lifetime if I'm optimistic. If I keep drinking Mellow Conspiracy and keep my spirits high, um, we may see some Martian breweries. Who knows? But um, that's not for us to figure out today. Today. Yep. We're just going to enjoy some beer. Thanks again, Sam. You rock. You're making amazing stuff. Um, yeah. Any final thoughts from you, Kyle, before we right, finish off these beers and sail off into the sunset or whatever we do? Head to the cellar and find something else to drink. <laughs> you know, honestly, that's probably what I should do is is figure out uh, what beer in my cellar needs to needs to be the one I have next. Because there's, there's plenty of stuff in there that I haven't looked at in quite a while and needs... Uh, needs to be had but no harrison it's just always a pleasure joining you and always a pleasure obviously chatting with our guest uh super stoked to uh to chat with him today that's right yep so again thanks sam thank you kyle everyone else out there thanks for listening thanks for checking along with us we'll throw our check-ins up of these beers as soon as we can find them toast them follow us on untapped all that fun stuff And until next time, keep your glasses clean and your cellars dark. We'll be here drinking some beer. Cheers, everybody. Bye.